and welcome to this episode of Mind the Gap, making education work across the globe with me, Tom Sherrington, and my great partner in crime, Emma Turner. Hello, Emma. Hello, Tom. It's so lovely to see you again. Are you well? Yeah, really well. And I think it's worth saying to everyone that this is a bit of a, a watershed episode for us because we are having a change in the way that our podcast is produced. And it means that we, whilst we get reorganised, <laughs> this is going to be the last one for a, a few weeks. So we're going to review what we've been doing so far uh, and then kick start again uh, when we're ready with, with more guests. But we're really going to reflect on on the podcast that we've been running for the last few years and and sort of share some of our highlights from it so it's been an amazing process hasn't it oh phenomenal it's been the best cpd i've ever had i think to get to talk to so many interesting wise and brilliant people it's it's been an absolute joy i've learned so much i don't know about you tom yeah and it's become a part of my life in a way to do, to do this podcast and as as our producer Sean tells us, you know, we've now reached a point where we have you know, nearly three thousand listeners per episode, and you know that kind of reach was something we never really imagined would happen. So we're really thrilled about that, and really honoured that people tune in. And in fact, just today, someone was telling me how they had been dialing in and they've been listening to. Uh, the the episode with Hal Roberts and saying thank you for introducing um him to me and someone else was saying they'd gone back to an episode uh lis listening to sarah cottingham and how useful and, and that that's the whole point isn't it there are people out there in the education world who not everyone knows who everyone is and it's just a you need to be able to share and, and give people a platform and to me that's been amazing and i'm looking at the dates of our episodes richard over episode one <laughs> june <laughs> the second 2020 so it's over three years so do you, have you got this whole rhythm now of you just sort of abandoning your family to go into the room to do the recording? I, I, I was such an advocate of no screens for children. No screens for children. Then we started doing this podcast and they regularly get the digital babysitter and now we're recording in the other room. In fact, they quite like it. Are you filming tonight, Mommy? Because we get to watch the telly. Uh, but it's it's been, a, like you say, a, a wonderful part of, the, of an evening, especially when we started it during lockdown to sort of feel connected to what was still happening out there, all the research that was going on, all the great thinking, all of the great work that was happening. And it's been an absolute pleasure to listen to people share that uh, over the years and to also kind of reflect on how it's completely changed my thinking in some areas as well. It's just, it's been absolutely instrumental in, in changing the way I view things, the way I approach things. So it's been such a pleasure, absolute pleasure. I'm, I'm reading down this list of guests and thinking, wow it's <laughs> it's like the oscars it's wonderful yes it is it is great and i think when we when we come back in our sort of um our reboot you know we we've got so many but we've got this enormous list of people uh that we want to talk to and our only rule because so people ask us like who, who do you invite are, are, we, only, we don't have that many rules we try to make sure that we've got a range of people from um different different contexts and different uh you know sector backgrounds and often people because of our you know we've been sponsored by john cat all this while so you know when people have had books and so on we like to give people the chance to talk about them but that hasn't been the main thing only about a third of our guests have have been in that category um sometimes people lobby us and say can you you know some people have agents literally they contact you and say can so and so talk on your podcast and we always say no because <laughs> we always say like if you ask it's actually the, the the quickest way not to be invited because <laughs> it always feels like we ought to be able to curate a kind of list of people that allows us to kind of make it a rounded set of people and i feel like that's one of the things i'm proud of so when i look down the list of, that it does feel like a, a very diverse range of people and it and across the kind of classic prog trad <laughs> axis i think we've done pretty well to span span that um in a way which i think is pretty healthy so we don't want to spend the whole time patting ourselves on the back but I'm, i i look down it and think yes yeah, that is a good list of people what do you think well i was just going to share with you the question i get asked most about the podcast which is what is tom sherrington really like <laughs> <laughs> i hope you're not totally honest <laughs> 
I'd be like, what's he like? I was like, I, I don't know, I meet him online. <laughs> I don't really see him in real life. He's very nice online. Um, but no, I am really pleased and really proud of the, the way that we've kind of represented all of the different um, sector, parts of the sector, all different phases, different levels of experience, different lived experiences, leaders, teachers, researchers, um, academics, university professors, and educationalists. It's been so great to get that kind of 360 view. And I don't necessarily think it's a pat on the back. I think it's us, us two just going, wow, aren't we lucky to have had that opportunity to, to listen to those to those voices because to be perfectly honest you and I sit here and we ask them questions and then sit back and let that let their wisdom roll out of them it's not like we've sort of carefully crafted questions for hours in advance have we <laughs> no and I, I I think that's the secret I mean so anyone who's thinking you know about the preparation I mean we, we we've we've done a, a, a podcast recently like we were invited onto the podcast with uh Craig Barton and Ollie Lovell and it's a bit like the kind of the the thing that was doing the rounds recently of people on their podcasts talking about each other's podcasts right? it wasn't quite like that we had actually a bit of a kind of nerd off about education it was amazing but theirs is like they they have a plan they send you questions in advance and um it's not totally scripted or anything but there's a bit of preparation and what we like to say to our guests is come on and we we have no questions in advance and emma and i don't even discuss what our questions are going to be so there's a kind of spontaneity to that slash totally unprepared but it's no, it, it is responsive, Tom. Yeah. That's what it is. It's adaptive and responsive in the moment. <laughs> well, it kind of is because it means you have to listen to what someone's saying and then and then sort of engage with them. And I know I don't mean people who prepare their podcasts aren't like that, but it's definitely been a, a kind of mental workout to listen and, and engage with people. So I, let, I, let, let's review some of the things that we've learned. I mean, there's there's something which you know some of the the sort of timeless. I feel like looking back over the the the, the back catalogue. One thing I noticed recently was on LinkedIn, someone had shared in uh, shared uh, that they had been listening to the episode with Dr. Robin Jackson, who she was on like she was like our fourth guest or something about the concept of building and uh, being a builder. And to me, that was it's those I like those metaphors. And she talks about professional development in schools and people being builders. We're creating something. We're making something. We have a and, and to me, that metaphor of building is rather than say improving, for example, you know, is is really lovely. I think that's a nice way of thinking about yourself as a person, but also an organization. And, and it means that when you're part of an organization, what you're trying to do is contribute to a con sort of construction of something amazing. And everyone has to participate and, and coordinate their activities to a sort of a common goal. And it also has a sense of, dreaming of something like you don't just build randomly you aim at something but then you know there's a kind of structure there's a kind of process to that but also it means you can imagine the thing before it's made and i don't know for me the, the metaphor has lots of power so that was great to hear someone saying it since they heard that that had really influenced the way they thought about their role like this thing of making building constructing so do you, she is do you one like, of the guests that i yeah. still think about that I yeah. really do still think about this whole builder mentality because she talked very much about process, but she also talked very much about the attitude that you have to have, that you have to build that team around you. And, you you know, there won't always be people who see that vision to start off with, but that you have to gradually build that team who do see it. And I, I just found both her kind of... um attention to kind of implementation and strategy alongside this absolutely unwavering positive attitude towards the fact that things can change and develop absolutely intoxicating and I keep I keep, keep thinking about what she said and I keep going back to it and she pops up on my feed every now and again and as soon as she does it's almost like I can hear everything that she was saying again so she is definitely one of the episodes that I that stayed with me and that I kind of think about when I'm thinking about implementation or I'm thinking about strategy. She's the, she's the name and she's the approach that that has resonated and, and remained. Even though we've spoken to lots and lots of people about lots of about leadership, I think you're right that, that that kind of metaphor of actually what you're trying to do is so powerful. So thank you for coming on. Yeah, and she's, she's also written a book called Never Work Harder Than Your Students, which is, <laughs> you know, I mean, oh my God. 
if only you know but i i get i understand why she's coming from on that front but that that's like that's the dream isn't it you know but that that that's fantastic so mm -hmm. i mean we let, let's let's run through a few, a few others i mean i think picking people out is like we're not trying to we, it's just things that you you remember the kind of the, the concepts and and the, the bigger things so what other let, let's share you share something that you think you've kind of I, over the three years this is a real personal one i just loved the complete maths geek off that was meeting Mark McCourt and Kieran Mackle. To be perfectly honest, that was a totally self-indulgent one, but I got to talk, to talk maths with two people who live, breathe, you know, everything, you know, every fibre of their being is about mathematics. And it was so lovely to have such a rich discussion. And even if you're not a mathematics specialist, if you're in primary and are a teacher of maths, I would thoroughly recommend listening to Keir and talk with such passion and precision about mathematics and to revisit his book and to listen to Mark again. And, I, and I've said it before that although Mark writes about maths or as he would have you say, mathematics, I'm not allowed to say maths in Mark's presence, um, his book is still the one I go to for um, kind of researching for practice. That, that first third of his book, Understanding Teaching for Mastery, is still my go-to. So it was an absolute joy to listen to Mark. I could never get tired of listening to that man. <laughs> that was my yeah, personal. I mean, he's, he's so insightful about the. I mean, I I remember it's funny how something stick in your mind. So I went to I've been to many many research shows. I know I have sort of bore on about this, but I have been to just you know, like forty of them. And they will let you in. You don't have to keep cheerleading for it, Tom. They will let you in. But one of them was uh, where I saw Martin Court doing his his session, and he um, it's one of the sessions from Research Ed as well that I remember more than any others, and just the way he ran the room and engaged him, and it it there's a kind of kind of just it a, re a refreshing new take on you know this whole thing of just opening up students' thinking but building on what they already know. So he got this fantastic example where he starts by saying something like. You know what's what numbers can up to, can up can add up to ten, and then uh, you know, what and then making it into negative numbers, and, and then sort of saying, well, well, he doesn't even start there. He just says, you know, what four plus what equals ten, but then what plus what equals ten, and then what about how do we know what numbers add up to any numbers? And it all sort of expands into this whole sort of exploration of what operation, what operation could you have in the middle then, and still do that and creating this expansive set of connected ideas starting with one simple idea which is you know four plus six equals ten and then it, it just to me that was just like i just wanted to be in his lessons <laughs> and i think that all the all the teachers all the people we speak to like if they're not teaching now that they they've been teachers and, and and reference their teaching as part of who they are still even mm -hmm. if they're not in a classroom and to, he, he's, he's an absolute classic of that kind mm -hmm. so yeah then moving into Kieran, I thought you and Kieran could. I thought I could just leave you to it, you know. Like. <laughs> if you'd have left us, I think we'd have still been talking. Yeah, and um, I think the fact that he's devoted such an amount of his professional time to really going so deeply with um, that's not a that's not a play on words for his book, but the fact that he had thought so deeply about primary mathematics because. When you teach 12 subjects as a primary teacher, you don't necessarily always have the luxury of, of doing that, of going deeply with one subject. And I think the work that he's done around that is so useful and so helpful for teachers who are teaching more than one subject. And he, um, again, like Mark, presents it with such clarity and such precision. And if you read his book, it takes you step by step exactly why you should do things in the order you should do them and how it all connects together, which connects together connects which um you don't necessarily have the time to think through in your planning so yeah i could talk to kieran for hours just the difference between manipulatives <laughs> we could debate that for hours it's brilliant how such special isn't it so so you know another person another couple of people we've had on um, you know who are kind of like i, I think uh, are right real specialists in what they're telling you uh, uh so someone like for example chris such talking about about reading uh was was just really wonderful and you you get this feeling like the knowledge he has about reading 
I wish everyone had because it would, you know, it would it would just make and Je- and Jenny Webb talking about writing and grammar. So the two of them together is like a kind of set of episodes. You just think you get the sense of, I mean, you got the maths people, <laughs> people who just how to run a room with reading, what how, what teachers need to know about reading and its and its intertwined elements. And then Jenny has this like amazing sort of way of talking about structures of writing and metaphors for that and how to communicate that to students. And you just think, oh, these. The, the ideas they have so you just i don't know there's a kind of energy you feed off isn't there where you think mm-hmm. oh god yeah, I'm into it. chris such's book is currently in my fruit bowl in my kitchen not for, <laughs> not because i don't value it but because i do value it because i read it so often in so many different places around my house i couldn't find it this morning and as i was leaving i just noticed it in the fruit bowl um, and it is one of those books that I recommend to any primary teacher. As soon as you've read it, it illuminates what we should be doing with early reading. And he's so generous that he's donated every single penny of the profits from that book to charity. He hasn't made a single penny out, but he's such a generous educator. And it's pretty. I think in honesty, in anything, he's been, he, I don't think you realise quite how well it would do. <laughs> <laughs> did he just say that? I, I was attributing him with a wonderful, <laughs> generous, altruistic streak no, there. You, I you might as well well give some of it away, but it's it, amazing. So there, so there, there are a couple of a genre of people. Mm-hmm. And another group of people we've had, uh, I would say I'd call them the kind of like... I know what you're going to say. I know, I know what you're going to say. I know it. <laughs> the thing is, is, there are a couple of like superstar people we've had on, and it, who, who uh, one of them is... Doug Lamov. and to me, it's still it's still our most listened to episode and re- and watched episode, and honestly, that was just amazing for me because he's I've, you know he is an amazing person and he's uh, in lots of ways. I mean, what he's created with Teach Like a Champion is extraordinary. But I just thought that, epi- and I watched. I would recommend to anyone like you know watch that episode and you see someone there who is so like earnest and thoughtful about teaching and sort of cares so much about about it working and about kids being taught well it, it's kind of intense there are moments there where he's just so sort of you know he, he just punches that through that kind of sincerity that sort of absolute commitment to wanting the the, the, the least confident in the child to feel they have a voice for example and what it's like to go to school where no one hears you you just you just I, you, you just you just want to, when i listen to that back i sometimes just go yeah like it, it fires me up. He's intensely reflective. He, he really, really is. He just sort of he thinks so deeply about everything. And I'm so pleased that episode was one of our most listened to because it's probably the most tired I've ever been in my life. <laughs> After we interviewed him, I did nine solid hours of lectures that day and they went straight into being interviewed by Doug. So quite how our formed a coherent sentence, I don't know. But yeah, that one with Doug was an absolute powerhouse of an episode and he's one of the ones that I've gone back and listened to again and again and taken something from each time because he's he's dropping so many little kind of pearls of wisdom you don't pick them all up the first time that you listen to it so I definitely uh, definitely recommend that but I think I know the other kind of potential trinity you were going to reference well yeah <laughs> well, the, the, we, and they, we had some people that came in a, in a three that like we had a run earlier this year. So we, we in, a, in a run of people, we had the kind of the Cogsci run, which was pretty fantastic. So we, I, I can't remember the order now, but Dylan William and Efrat first and Sarah Cottingham. And, yeah. this was, and there's, a, there's a run of those three where you think if you if you want to be interested in cognitive science and our understanding of how we learn, those three episodes are like a are, are like a CPD session. They're not like a, a chat show. And mm. Dylan, Dylan is, he's I've seen people just have comment about like it's like it's packed with kind of almost his greatest hits. It's like Dylan Williams' greatest hits in my episode. <laughs> it's fantastic. He nests nails it down, doesn't he? <laughs> sort of this is this is you know the whole thing about the difference between all the links between the concepts of responsive teaching formative assessment assessment for learning you know what do all those words mean well there's a structure to that that you're organizing those think those thoughts makes you realize what's involved and how important it is for teachers to engage with the students in a in a dialogic way and then linked to efra and all her stuff about encoding 
I love that whole thing we got into about her teaching teachers now and how she has yeah. this meta thing of encoding, encoding. Like she's trying to teach her students who are training teachers about encoding. So she says, I'm having to encode the encoding. And anyway, so for me, her, and then finally Sarah Cottingham, whose who's, who's in action book came out in July with the Owls of Bells uh, making meaning in action. But she's so thoughtful and knowledgeable about how we construct meaning during a teaching episode. So the three of them together, like, ooh. so yeah, bang the drum for those three. It was like the greatest cog size starter pack ever. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> so, totally, if you yeah. want to get want to get going and get interested and get up on the right foot with kind of research informed practice, cognitive science, that's the three to start with, most definitely. And I, I will admit, I have gone back and listened to those three again and again and again because. Yeah. <laughs> I feel like, you know, D D Dylan William is someone who, you know, he's probably more quoted, well, him and Dan William together probably than anyone else. And for good reason. And he's he's done the miles. And I enjoy the fact that we, we share various things in common, like we both taught the Smile Maths package back in the 80s. <laughs> and also, you know, there's some other things like playing the bass guitar, you know, which is, like quite, which is quite funny. <laughs> But he's, you know, he he. But he's also this is the thing, science, science and maths specialist. But the th the three of those people are really brilliant at understanding what it means for teachers. So we're not just talking about experiments and findings and studies that are kind of a bit abstract and obscure. We're talking about what does it mean when you're doing it in the lesson, what using the ideas. And I think that's that can, comes through from all three of them. That sense that cognitive science has to make be useful to us in it. If you know if it's going to have value, it's got to turn into things we can do, mm -hmm. and yeah, I, I think hopefully that came through really well. Okay, so one of the things I really like, just one one last thing, is the fact that we've had some fantastic practicing school leaders on here: Sam Strickland, Sonia Thompson, people who are talking not only from a very research informed perspective, but kind of. Boots on the ground, <laughs> day in, day out. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, with um, it's been such a delight to hear theory in action and actually and see Diana, Asagi. I mean, yeah, all these people, head teachers or former head teachers, yeah. sharing sharing the world mm -hmm. of leadership. It's been so brilliant to hear so many yeah. diverse lived experiences of leaders in the system and actually what's happening in schools right now that people can learn from and think about and potentially translate into their own practice. So uh, a big thank you to those people who did a full day's graft at school and then, <laughs> and then came and spoke to us in the evening as well to share their thoughts. Well, of course, it's like we select the people. So, you know, we can't pretend that to be anything that's representative. But I, I think it's interesting that, you know, you know, early on, we talked to John Thompson and Johnny Utley, who are, you know, well known for promoting. The fact they just launched a new website about putting staff first, which is their whole concept for, you know, creating the right culture. Uh, but then, you know, listening to most recently Caroline Derbyshire and Vic Goddard, the sense of responsibility they carry as leaders of schools and then the challenge is the honesty around that that sense of the weight they carry on their shoulders and and yet the kind of absolute commitment to it to the point where you'd think the way they project you could you could you might be thinking the way they project the level of responsibility is going to want to say oh my god who'd ever want to be a head teacher <laughs> but actually in the way they talk about their community and the people they serve and and supporting the teachers it actually makes you want to be one because you're thinking I'm inspired by them. I, I want to be Vic Goddard. You know? <laughs> I want to be Caroline Derbyshire. I want to be the person who could do that and be have that role. And I feel like they kind of fly the flag for leadership, even whilst talking about how difficult it is. It's a pretty amazing yeah. thing to put off. Yeah. Definitely. <laughs> well, yeah, I mean, you've been there so more recently than me. So <laughs> it's like connecting. I've been wrangling with a budget today, Tom. <laughs> well, I know. I feel like, you know, there's a kind of a need to sort of champion. I think this is something we don't always do well in, in our system is but it's difficult to do both, isn't it? To talk about the honest challenges that teachers have and the reason why it's not everyone's preferred job. But at the same time as 
the fact that all these people and they're so they have so much to contribute it's so intellectually interesting as well as kind of emotionally satisfying and rewarding that we're doing this good work it's difficult to get that message out there isn't it this, this is why teaching in the world of education is so brilliant that you know mm-hmm. it's full of all these people for a start but you can't soft soap the challenges there's no point in pretending to people that it's easier than it is it's the, yeah, it's I mean, the peaks yeah. and troughs the, the high days are really high the low days are really low <laughs> <laughs> yeah but then you you listen to i don't know let's say say vic you'd want to go and work at your school tomorrow because yeah. you just feel like with him there like i'm with you I'm, I'm 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 just and i i think that's important that we have people who can who can do that but then there's a whole other group of people not there so there's there's um there's the people who tell it as it is in terms of the challenges some kids have got so i mean i'm thinking they're pe- people like um francis akindi Su- Sufian. yeah who are you thinking of francis akindi Oh yeah, and she spoke Frankie, so beautifully. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So you know, Frankie came on. She talked about being a senko, um, being a fairly you know being the, someone who's often the only black leader in a in a room mm-hmm. of leaders, and special needs schools feeling marginalised. So that she she feels like she's coming from the margins, and she talks about her own ADHD and stuff like that all the time. And yet, like she's her, her thing is break, you know, breaking the bias. She, you know, she works in all these different spheres, supporting young people, and yeah, that that's a, a punchy, punchy episode. And then also Tracy and Tracy Adams, and Sonia's been on twice. She's one of the few people we've had on twice. Tracy Adams and Sonia. I think I'm not sure if we broke the news about this, but they are sisters. <laughs> but what extraordinary pair of people they are! So they work together, and well, now they're. Tracy's now right this year is a head of a of a school uh, of her own, but they they like head and deputy head of a school sisters yeah. and what an amazing school. But they talk about the kids, the what they bring to their school, their you know, and I think one of the most powerful episodes we've had was and he'll he'll be pleased to say this. he'll be pleased with saying this because he, he likes to he he's funny about it. Sufi and Sadiq. And the episode he talked about his own back, that was very powerful, wasn't it? It was. I'm just laughing because I've never, have you seen him do his gag about the, the standing ovation? Have you seen him do no. this? No. <laughs> if I tell you, I'll never be able to. What is that? What does he say? He makes every, before he does his keynote, makes everyone stand up and clap. Then he takes a video of it with himself smiling. He says, well, now I'm going to post this on YouTube because you've all given me a standing ovation. So it doesn't really matter how my keynote goes now. <laughs> uh, very good. <laughs> but but whenever, I, whenever I think of him, I think of him doing this gag with a standing ovation, which is why I was laughing as soon as you mentioned his name. Yeah, but this is, so Sufian is a, is a storyteller um, and there are other people in common. So, how Roberts we had on similar like they have this they have this amazing gift for presenting as the as the kind of you know light touch humorous person who then like absolutely gives you this this sort of punch in the stomach of emotional power oh, yeah. with the message and you know when Suf- Sufian talked about walking the walk to school um through the kind of you know the the urine s- stench in the lift in the tower block and that's someone's start to the day every day um meeting the teacher who's like picked up their latte from the cafe you know the kind of world's colliding and that need to kind of bridge that social that social gap and and not just talk about um you know that that social gap poverty gap in people uh, which affects people's perception of their identity and their potential life and so on it is pretty profound and it makes you think whoa but then he's like a <laughs> when he started reading off all the charities he's a trustee of it was <laughs> i think oh my god i'm like worst person alive because he's so he's so like multiply engaged isn't he? it's extraordinary yeah and um, he him and how roberts that kind of whole botheredness approach really thinking about where children are coming from before they arrive the door of the school um i think he's a, a really important pair of episodes to potentially listen to is to listen to howland to listen to sufian 
in terms of uh, life beyond school gates, which is what I've yeah. taken from listening to to those two is to think about the kind of the motivations and the experiences that children have before they arrive in a classroom. But it's a, a really nice pair to kind of reflect on if you listen to them together. And it wasn't deliberate that we had them so close together either, was it? Was it was just complete chance. But they do yeah. go together so nicely, so nicely. You haven't yeah. mentioned Jim Knight yet. No, Tom, I'll see we that. are. However many minutes <laughs> in, and you've still not mentioned Jim. Come on. <laughs> okay, so. Yeah, I mean, to be honest with you, I mean, I, I sit, sitting um, as, as this as we're recording this, and it's, but and it's one of those things with the time today. But by the time this goes out, I will have uh, met him at his uh, conference. That would have been just a week before. So Oliver Caviglioli and I are going to Orlando for the annual conference of the instructional coaching group that uh, that Jim runs and. Um, it's actually at SeaWorld in Florida, which is insane, <laughs> in a big hotel there. But yeah, and there's like 1,500 people going to be there talking about instructional coaching. So it's, it's a big thing in the US, and it's, it's something which is developing in the UK in multiple forms and has been for a while. And it's something we discuss a lot. So to talk to him directly was was great. I mean, he's so uh, he, he, his work is so influential. And he represents a kind of mindset around coaching, which is very focused on teachers driving things, being the owners of their own solutions. and But yet the coach being so key to that. So I, I feel like he, he does allow in his work, a kind of allow for a wide range of interpretations of the coaching structures and things. So Oliver and I take a lot of inspiration from him in the stuff we try to do because he 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 does keep you focused on the teacher being the person who then has to own their own goal and pursue their own process, mm -hmm. and he does push back a little bit on things which, which get a little bit too uh, top down, a bit too systematized, and um, with, with, with that's great. So you've got a sort of he represents a whole sort of philosophy which I feel like is coherent and healthy and needs to be explored. So yeah, to me, I mean, I was. It was a bit like a you know meet your hero moment, but he's so generous. I mean, he's always saying that like he's he's so kind to to us and saying that he's you know enjoys the conversation and uh, he's just such a, a a wonderful person. So I, I really really enjoyed that. When are you going? <laughs> well, last week. <laughs> last week. <laughs> So how you get to Florida, and I just go to various places off the M62. <laughs> I've yeah, got well, it all wrong. I've got it all yeah, wrong. So we, it's, we're kind of quite not. I'd say I don't know if we're nervous or such, but it's, we're excited that we're going to be talking at this event and sharing some of our thoughts about um, how coaching can be supported by structures um, rather than sort of inhibited by them. So I think we're. And it's also interesting to talking to people in the US. And one one of the things about our podcast is we've had various people from the US, and it, the systems aren't the same clearly. But it's finding finding the common ground, which is so so you know great. Um, mm -hmm. Yeah, so that that's been from obviously meeting you know seeing him was was brilliant. Okay, wow. So I mean, it, if you have to, what, another sort of group of people I feel it's been amazing to have are people who are kind of like like sort of communicators about teaching in 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 ways which they kind of don't they don't need to do but they are motivated to by by numerous things and some of them are kind of right in the system uh, and some are kind of uh, i guess supporters of it and so i'm thinking of a, a couple of different groups so there's craig barton and adam boxer are kind of like you know the output between the two of them of ideas about it so in craig's case maths and in adam's and, and wider teaching but maths plus wider and adam the same for science plus behavior management and through their blogging and through craig's podcasting i i think they're phenomenal people <laughs> really do so to me like hearing how they present themselves and what motivates them and the, the way they think they're, they're different the different types of people but they were a week apart in our podcast last summer and 22. Craig has written the biggest John Cat teaching book ever. <laughs> 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 
<laughs> so many, so many tips. It's it's uh, what two two three inches thick. <laughs> yeah. Uh, Adam, Adam's just, you know, he's, I mean, he, there, again, it's something of an intensity, a bit like Demok Bogomov in some ways, so there's just being really a kind of sense of conviction. You know, there's a kind of joyfulness, a kind of enthusiasm which comes through, but there's also this total conviction that this is important and it matters and we, we can't muck about with it. And I, I love that. I love that energy that they bring to the discourse on Twitter and through all this. I, I, I think they're just, just phenomenal. So to hear them, share their ideas you know i really recommend the adam box for episode just for talking about say his reluctant engagement with behavior management <laughs> i hate talking about behavior management but and it's, it's our only episode with an ice cream van in it as well <laughs> yeah it, did. it went past the window <laughs> it went past the window as we were talking to him yes <laughs> what, what they both have in common, and this is funny, is that they both are right, up in the attic. So they both have like an office in their house, it seems, which is upstairs with a sloping ceiling. So to me, I, I, that really struck me, the parallel between them. Like, there's Adam, and then there's there's Craig, sort of upstairs in this... You, you imagine this room where, like, this is the powerhouse, this is their kind of... <laughs> where the, all the ideas are, are generated, escaping through, like... Crawled away in the eaves. <laughs> Snatch, snatching time away from family obligations to try try to do all this stuff. And I and I think that's you know not easy. So I have total respect for them for that. And the other two people, Laura, Laura McInerney and, and Becky Allen, who are kind of a, a bit of a duo through Teacher Tap. And we've interviewed both of them. And they, again, through their sort of engagement with assistant, the contribution they make to our discourse, I think, is brilliant i mean absolutely adore both of those interviews i particularly enjoyed the look on your face when laura told you your teacher tap score didn't count <laughs> <laughs> my teacher tap score didn't count yeah, yeah that is <laughs> <laughs> i don't know i should ever forget <laughs> i know it's funny because Teacher Tap is brilliant, and they have nearly, I think, what, they vote, they've passed the 10,000 mark, right? So they've got 10,000 teachers who, on, I, I'm not sure if they get that every day, but it's that scale now. It's, it's on that kind of area daily, which is just amazing. I don't think there's anything like that in any other world um, sphere in, in this country. We get that number of people polling every day. But the people who are not teachers, who sort of have the app, who are who maybe used to be a teacher but aren't in a school and therefore can't talk about their school <laughs> i asked what happens to our results and basically their answer was they ignore them <laughs> so, I was like, so all those times i've been sort of like putting my penneth into the the, the question of the day was a total waste of time it's a file 13 <laughs> yeah they don't need you so i was kind of like Okay, I get. Obviously, you get why. Why would I? Why would anyone want to care what I think about about the poll? Because I don't have a lesson to teach today. I haven't done five lessons, and so fair enough. But yeah, that, I love the honesty of that. But yeah, I mean, and and Becky Allen is absolutely fantastic. Just relating to the whole thing of being a, an education kind of professional. Where she's she's done so many great talks. I kind of put her in the deep end because I was reminding her of talks she gave years ago, which were with no preparation. And she was like, okay, oh my God, we're talking about that one, are we? And she had to like remember the case she'd made like <laughs> five years ago. But she's brilliant at like relating to the whole thing of having kids in school now and having to sort of be the be the receiver of the education system as well as the kind of the thinker about it. And that's so interesting, isn't it? Like not, not everyone talks about their kids' experience at school, but she was quite open to <laughs> so, so that challenge. Well, yeah. Do your, do your kids' parents, do, your, do your, your kids' teachers know that you're on here talking about their, them at school? Uh, I'm the chair of governors at the school as well. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, they're, they're, I'm very, very lucky. Their school is fantastic. The teachers are wonderful and they're... I've, I've never named the school that I never would, but I'm I'm absolutely blessed that they go to a truly brilliant primary school with fantastic teachers and just it, whenever I, anybody says where do you go to see good practice, I always say there because it's just it's just completely solid and they're an absolute joy. But they they know that sometimes when I'm talking about my children that 
they'd be able to work out it's their school, but I don't think I've ever said anything bad because I have nothing bad to say about them. <laughs> uh-huh. Well, it's, that that's good. I mean, it's, you have to you have to sort of you know be sensitive about these things. People don't always be able to be discussed. It's a bit like what happens to me when 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 when, when my wife goes to work and, and people tell her they like what like our garden and she goes how do you know about my garden and I go well I've been tweeting more pictures of it and <laughs> sometimes yeah share, oversharing maybe but um, oh, you know okay. so look the, the, I mean we've had so many guests and it's over three years and mm-hmm. it, it's been amazing I, I, one of the some of the themes that have come through we talked a little about leadership and talked about you know some of the things that are in maths and writing and one of the things I think is that we've we talked talked about is CPD. You know, we're talking about Heidi Hughes and mentoring. That was fantastic. Cognitive science, but behaviour has been one. So we talked to Tom Bennett really early on, mm-hmm. um, and I think there, <laughs> there was a bit of a faux pas in that episode, wasn't there? <laughs> I, yeah. I miss. I misworded my opening question and I meant to say I'd miss I was under the impression that the book was just a secondary book so I hadn't read it as quickly as I potentially could have done but it came out all right all wrong and I said I deliberately haven't read your book (laughs) which wasn't the best start (laughs) to the issue I think that was that was our my naivety as a co-host writ large (laughs) right there (laughs) yeah but, but you know, there's a, there's a good recovery, and if you combine the input of, say, you know, Tom and uh, and um, Sam Strickland, who's another person who's been on twice, you just have this um, rich knowledge for two of them between them around behaviour management. You know, one of them, Tom's obviously famous for like all his thinking around behaviour, running the room, and Sam is a school leader doing it in his own school. And obviously supporting others with his own, and his own books. So it's it's the their ideas are, are fantastic. And sometimes I feel like you know, like a lot of these things, there's a lot of mischaracterization and kind of shallow reading of people's um, views on 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 it. And and I've sat I've sat several days with Tom in his training room, and people who think that he represents a kind of like draconian school culture is just literally no idea what he's talking about what he's talking about because he isn't talking about that he's talking about routines norms things which support teachers to be successful it's very human um and it's it's important and just like other people we've mentioned get kind of fired up about the wrongs of things and what fires tom up is seeing teachers struggling and kids struggling in environments which could be properly ordered and they're not and they're not safe and they're not comfortable and the kids aren't learning and that's worth getting bothered about and i feel like you know i, I often i don't know why i mean tom's a <laughs> he, he can stick up for himself but i often feel like why why do you why do, why does someone who i feel get, contributes so much to our discourse get such a hard time from people sometimes i think why are you trying to make it harder for us to to hear sensible things which will really make schools better? And honestly, if more schools were doing the things that Tom is advocating, our system would be way, way better than it is. And there's no doubt about it. It's interesting as well because Sam's school that he runs, 2,000 pupils, it's the size of a small town, basically. Um, and it's an all through, so it's 4 to 18. And... I go there quite a lot, various bits and bobs. But you recommend going to one of his open days. But it's one of the warmest, most caring, nurturing places that you could go to. But just really, really well run, really, really well ordered, happy children, teachers with the space to teach. Um, and again, it's it's very easy, I think, sometimes to to assume what you think something's like until you've actually seen it in practice. And I would... Uh, I would fully advocate going to have a little visit to see what to see what some of these systems look like in action um, on the ground. <laughs> yeah, I, t- I totally agree. Well, look, I mean, this is probably you know for, I don't know how how this comes through. It's it's hard to know, isn't it? When but f- I'm hoping if people are listening to this, they're kind of getting a sense of I don't know, like the range of people that 
participate in our system and how exciting it is to have all these voices and hopefully through our our podcast people have been introduced to people they may not have heard of before or just had a chance to hear them speak um when they haven't heard them speak at an event uh and our most recent guests that this 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 side of the summer alam shaha just what a beautifully sensitive creative person he is um sharing his passion for science and then communicating ideas to children through his his work as, a, as an author now as well as still being a teacher and of course ben umark and his amazing sort of sensitivity and insight into send and bringing his sort of personal perspective with his own daughter's education into it and i think those two are just beautiful episodes so i'm really proud of that and uh it's it's been amazing so the last thing i want to mention before we wrap up is actually how we've done quite a few of us of us of our own <laughs> and i actually think talking to you as well is the, definitely the best bit of this whole thing oh it's so and i don't you. like it's true it's just like you know you your your wisdom about teaching is amazing and i'm going to just sort of finish this up you know book plug deluxe this arrived today i think it's quite significant that on our our last day of recording this podcast with our current setup ahead of the break this book landed on my mat today Initium. <laughs> <laughs> to use its proper pronunciation <laughs> cognitive it's science and people... research reform primary practice it's fantastic emma you just how, how do you find the time to write a book as thorough as this as well as all the other things you do straight i don't know work? i think i don't know i think i just got a bit cross and so <laughs> <laughs> <I> wrote it <laughs> but it's, a, got... it's a lovely uh exploration of know, how cognitive science works in a specifically a primary context for children who are forming their learning from the start and yeah. it's 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 fantastic so thank you congratulations i hope it does really well <laughs> and thank you i would yeah. just say though i know it says primary practice on the front of it um but anybody who's secondary who's read it said like bradley bush has read it and uh, Carl Hendrick read it, and um, who was it that Oliver's read it? And they were saying that they have said every secondary teacher needs to read this because they kind of know yeah. where where it comes from. So although I may have made another classic turn of faux pas by saying it's cognitive science and research for primary practice, because actually, if you really want to understand how children learn, you kind of have to need you need to understand where the building blocks came from. So although it's yeah. primary. I would definitely say if you're secondary, you might want to have a little dabble, have a little look and see what primary practice is. And especially, and this is kind of a plea from me, especially if you're delivering training to primary colleagues and you are a secondary background, please, please, please um, have a little look at it. <laughs> totally. I mean, and it's, you know, the fact that anything that says primary on it, of course, it should be for everyone, really, because we all want to know what that is. And I'm just going to finish this, if you don't mind, by the, the last, just the last, the conclusion of this clue, right. using the Latin, which you put all the way through. Legatum et ultra, legacy and beyond. And then you've written, teaching is legacy, legacy is therefore duty. And it's like that sense, of, I don't know, it's something about that's like, it's, there's a kind of, that sense of duty and that, that, that sense of kind of purpose that comes through everyone that we've talked to, I think it's, is universal and you know, everyone we speak to has a feel a commitment to the children that they're teaching wants to do the best they can and recognizes the difficulty but anything that we're doing and sharing hopefully contributes to that and people out there doing it day to day and i'm well aware of the fact that i don't teach five hours a day um and it's a lot easier to do nearly any other job <laughs> except that so, you know, well, thank you to other people listening who are taking anything we say and using it for actually teaching students, uh, children in their classrooms. Really, you know, it's amazing. We wouldn't be doing this if, if there was no no purpose to, to serve in that sense. So thank you to everyone, everyone listening. Thank you, Emma, for being an amazing co-host. Thank you, Tom. It's been a, an absolute pleasure doing this podcast with you. And thank you again to everybody who's kind of listened. And thank you again for putting in the hours with the children out there because that's the most that's the most important work. So thank you so much. Yeah, so I mean it, I think it remains for us to say a huge thank you to Sean Ryan, our producer. Um this is our, our last episode working with Sean. Um 
and but it's been brilliant and he's been absolutely amazing to support us all the way through and we're looking forward to reconfiguring there'll be a small gap while we get a a, a different um, production kind of process working but we'll still be mind the gap and we'll still be tom and emma and we'll be back with more uh more guests as, as soon as we possibly can but thanks so much for listening everybody and we'll see you all really soon Thank you.